Hey everyone, welcome to our session. Today we're going to be talking about GitHub's Open API description. Um, as you may have seen, we've just released our open source uh, Open API description under GitHub REST API description. Um, as you may imagine, GitHub API is pretty large, so it's quite a challenge. Um, and today's talk is could be uh, interesting if you're interested in seeing how we went from almost kind of zero machine readable descriptions to having a full ac accurate open API description. Um, so my name is Mark. I'm on the API team at GitHub and I'm joined by Andrew. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew. Uh, my uh, handle is a Hoagland at GitHub and you can find me on Twitter at Andrew Hoagland. And so uh, I'd like to just uh, start here by giving you a brief history of the GitHub API and uh, kind of some context around uh, what led us to this project and uh, some of the reasons why we did it. Uh, so la last year I gave a quick uh, talk that kind of gave a brief history of the GraphQL API, or excuse me, the uh, REST API. Uh, so this may be a repeat for some of you who attended, but um, yeah, uh, so the REST API was announced um, <clears throat> Uh, in 2008, uh, you know, this is an API that has stood the test of time. It's evolved uh, pragmatically uh, um, and responded to needs of integrators uh, th through this 12 year period. Uh, in that period, we've launched three major versions. Uh, I haven't been around for all of those and that neither has Mark, but uh, yeah, currently we're on uh, sort of the V3 version. And, uh, you know, one thing I just wanted to note about the history of this uh, API is that, uh, you know, when it was released, there was no sort of industry standard uh, way to describe APIs in a machine readable way. Uh, RAML, for example, was uh, proposed in 2013, as well as JSON API. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, JSON schema and Open API, which uh, also were not uh, around at that time. <clears throat> and, you know, with the fact now that it, Open API seems to be getting, gaining the industry traction that it has, it, you know, definitely made sense for us to uh, start looking at, you know, describing our API with something and uh, Open API definitely was the best fit. Uh, the other thing that sort of uh, gave the, the other thing that uh, made it a little bit difficult for us was that when GraphQL came out, uh, there was a bit of a, a lack of direction in terms of like what would be the next version of the REST API. Uh, initially, I think a lot of people at GitHub thought it would be GraphQL and it would sort of replace REST, but uh, we sort of changed our, our mentality on that and our approach. So now that uh, we're, we're more approaching it from a uh, standpoint that we we're going to support REST and GraphQL at the same time. And so definitely making this investment and describing the REST API and 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 making it a first class citizen and and, and giving it the attention it needs uh, was something that we, we felt was worthwhile. So, like I said, uh, we, we're going to go over some of the whys. Um, one, of course, is automation, a automate our uh, a lot of our work workflows. So SDKs, documentation. Um, the other thing that we wanted to try to do is introduce a design driven uh, workflow for developers uh, rather than having design be an afterthought or a no thought at all, or worst case, having uh, our team come in and and sort of uh, re request that uh, implementing feature teams change uh, like the overall design of their API after they've written a bunch of the implementation code, you know, doesn't always go well. And, and, and a lot of times it's, it's not something that is comfortable for everybody. Uh, and then lastly, we, we wanted to uh, remove ourselves, the API team, um, from being a bottleneck, uh, sort of a gatekeeper of the API. So our idea was that we could build more consistent tooling around the developer experience and then leverage Open API as a way to enforce that consistency. And uh, we felt like doing these types of things would solve all of these problems. Uh, yeah, so first, um, our our documentation uh, over the years has been mostly uh, maintained manually. So the documentation team has done a fantastic job of keeping uh, our REST API described, uh, although that's just basically been a, uh, a process of uh, developers sort of uh, coming up with their implementations and then working side by side with the, the docs team to 
then uh, create uh, the necessary documentation. But none of that was automated. None of that was programmatic. Uh, it was all done in uh, a, a manual way with, with a minimal amount of, of tooling. So definitely being able to do this is a great, a great step because we can re reduce a lot of the manual work uh, that goes on for our documentation and also the SDKs. Uh, initially, we had the idea of uh, describing our our API with Open API so that we could, like I said earlier, come up with a design-driven uh, workflow um, and put the API design in front of the implementation and have a more consistent developer experience. Uh, although this project uh, that we started with um, didn't actually end up being the way that we solved it, uh, we still are planning on uh, doing this um, in a, kind of a next phase of our project. So uh, instead of uh, introducing a design-driven workflow for new endpoints going forward, uh, we decided to instead work backwards and try to describe the entire API. And then through that, we would learn whatever we needed to learn uh, in order to best inform how we wanted that design-driven workflow to go. And uh, lastly, we, we, you know, we wanted to remove ourselves, like I said, as, as um, gatekeepers. Uh, so that we don't have to rubber stamp dozens of pull requests every single week. And uh, we can then transform our team into the role of uh, either design consultants uh, when they want to have the discussions about what's the best way to, to design the APIs. And then also it frees us up as a team to uh, focus more on improving the tooling and the plumbing of the API. Okay, yeah, so what are some of the challenges we face along uh, the way or kind of that we faced uh, even before starting? Uh, one is that we have seven, over 700 operations. Uh, we have five parallel versions that we're dealing with and also sort of mo multiple sources of truth that we had to uh, reconcile with each other. So 700 operations also needs to be clarified that we also have uh, aliases for a lot of these um, operations. Um, so in one of the iterations of uh, our versions, uh, there was a decision to go from a resource-based to an ID-based uh, uh, um, layout of our of the of the routes of the API. Uh, but that work was never fully transitioned over. So even to this day, we still have a resource-based. API. If you look at our, our current state of our of the of the REST API, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, we didn't still have to consider this because internally we have a, a a mapping between the implementation, which is all ID based, and we have a routing layer to sort of reconcile and and match those those public facing ones with the uh, internal representations. So this just added a lot of complexity and and kind of head scratching around how do we deal with this and 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 move forward. Uh, like I said, we had five different. Uh, we have five different versions. So we have the api.github.com, what we refer to as the .com version, and we ha also have uh, four uh, GitHub Enterprise versions that we have to support. Uh, and lastly, uh, we have a lot of different sources of truth. So one is the documentation that's sort of blindly trusted uh, by integrators as as a source of truth for our API, uh, and even even though it's it it's done a great job of describing it very very accurately uh, even even given the fact that it's been done mostly manually uh, we we wanted to try to move the the description of the API closer to the actual source of truth to the implementation and the code um, also along the way uh, there were other uh, other iterations of our team uh, introduced JSON schema to help describe our API but that was incomplete. It only it only uh, describes the mutations, so posts and puts and deletes of uh, endpoints, and it only deals with the request bodies. Uh, there's no uh, description of uh, response objects, and and that was another problem that we had is uh, a lack of test coverage with our serializers and our integration tests of all of the API endpoints. So yeah, now I'm going to hand it off to Mark, and he's going to talk a little bit about how we solve these problems. All right, thanks, Andrew. So we're going to look at how we solve these challenges um, by kind of taking a different approach than maybe what you're used to. So a lot of companies will write an open API description pretty much by hand. Uh, if the API is small enough, 
a handwritten open API description is probably the best you can do um, because with some human love and understanding, you can kind of get to a description that is better than a machine generated one. Uh, for us though, dealing with such a huge API and such an old API, um, it was pretty much impossible. We're a small API team and writing a whole open API description, even though it would be nice, um, would take way too long. So instead we decided to use the starting points uh, that Andrew touched on a little bit and try to get something better out of them. So first thing we had was this open API description that was scraped from our documentation website. And the goal of that description was to power our documentation website. And it worked great. Uh, um, our the documentation team relaunched the site using that description. Um, it was a well-built description, but we couldn't trust it entirely because it was built from the docs in the first place. So it could only be as accurate as our documentation website. And since it wasn't used by our integration tests or runtime validators, there was no way it would be fully, fully accurate. We knew there would probably be some human errors, probably some fields that were forgotten about or never documented. The other source we had was those JSON hyper schemas in the code base. These ones were actually used for validating requests and responses, but they didn't represent all of our endpoints. They were only on certain of them. And generally, as Andrew said, only on only describe request bodies and not necessarily response payloads. So what we did is try to generate a new open API description based on the one from docs and our existing JSON schemas. So we wrote a backfill script that basically merged these two. Um, and when it encountered a request body, for example, it preferred JSON schemas. But when it encountered something like a summary or a description or even response payloads, it would prefer the docs open API because we knew we could trust that part. So what we ended up with was an open API description that we would hope would be kind of best of both worlds. But we couldn't trust it entirely either, right? What we wanted to do is go from kind of this pyramid of how confident we feel about our open API description. And we really believe we were kind of at the bottom when we got there, right? Because we were using something that was from our docs website and JSON schemas that were quite accurate, but incomplete as well. So we knew there had to be some gaps. So basically the first step we wanted to get to is to have an open API description that fully passes against our whole suite of integration tests. So that's what we ended up doing. But the challenge there was we knew this description was probably full of errors. So we couldn't just start contract testing uh, in, in our production CI and have builds fail and force every GitHub engineer to fix tests. Um, that would have been the worst for, uh, for our team. So what we ended up doing was injecting, injecting an open API validation middleware in tests in a special build that doesn't run with the usual build so that it doesn't block anyone's development. And instead of failing CI, this validation middleware would basically just log errors. Um, and after a full CI build, it would kind of upload this, what we call validation report, full of open API failures. Um, as I said, we didn't really know um, how accurate or not our description were. So the first time we ran that build, we were kind of hoping to see not too many errors because that would mean not too much work. Um, instead, when we first saw the first uh, report, we were met with 37,000 individual errors um, 500 more and almost 500 invalid operations. Um, so that was a little depressing and we knew we couldn't fix that by hand either. Going through every single test, trying to understand what went wrong, trying to understand which property we're missing or the wrong type, that was impossible. So we had to be a bit more creative than that and take that validation report, which we had as HTML, but also output it as a JSON file and basically build a script that would take every error and try to come up with a fix to the original document to fix that error. Um, so that wasn't always possible in complex cases, but in some cases where maybe we were missing a property 
or something was required but it was never passed we could actually deduct what the actual fix should be because we trust our integration tests to be the truth um, so our validation build would run all the integration tests again that validation middleware the middleware would report failures and then we would turn these failures into a chasen patch document to be applied to our original document so we ran that a few cycles right every time we fix some new ones would appear would auto fix those as well um, and we got down to pretty low and with some a bit of human love some special fixes um, we eventually ran a test where the validation report looked like this um, so that meant all our integration tests passed through an open api validation middleware and the description was valid for the requests and responses that were passing by. So it was great news. Um, and what we've learned through the, the whole process basically is that OpenAPI is more than just an artifact that we use to print some docs. Um, during the whole process, we discovered inconsistencies between responses. Uh, just um, the concept of a component made, made us think differently about responses. We found out that certain payloads were missing fields. Um, others were identical, which we refactored into a component. Um, it's, it truly was uh, a great potential for us to basically think more about our design and think differently about our design. And although this is kind of just a beginning for us because now, now we have the, a full complete spec that we're pretty confident in. And from now on, we hope that all development goes through open API. So, and that, that confidence that the open API validation test gives us is that we know that no fields never going to be forgotten about and not documented. And we'll be fully confident that our documentation truly reflect what goes on in our integration tests and soon our runtime behavior as well, which is kind of the next step we want to achieve soon. So the other thing is we really want um, to have this, this spec be open source because we know we know there's going to be edge cases. We want to address them, but we're also very eager to see what the community builds with that um, by having a full description of GitHub's API, um, mock servers can be generated, different SDKs. So we're really looking forward to see what the community does with that. So if there's any questions, if your company is trying to get an open API description and starting from zero, if you're just interested in our description in general, uh, please do reach out to Andrew or I on Twitter is probably best. Thanks. <laughs>